Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Today is Friday, August 19th, 2022. Hey, we're ticking down to the end of the summer here. The traditional end of summer, of course, being the Labor Day weekend, uh, when after which Congress will come back and there will be all sorts of uh, news and stories uh, to fill our days. But things are not quiet this summer. There's an awful lot going on. Uh, we have a, a number of stories that are popping up here today, especially in Ukraine, where the Zaporizhia nu nuclear plant is under threat from the Russians again. And this time Turkey is asking Russia to withdraw in, uh, in favor of probably international monitors or per perhaps an, a neutral security force uh, to... Uh, to guard against any attacks on Europe's biggest nuclear plant. And this has been a concern uh, for the last uh, six months because this is a nuclear plant that Russia actually took early in the war uh, and were launching uh, artillery strikes and, and sheltering their infantry from that uh, to basically using it as a shield for their offensive operations in Ukraine. Now they're starting to fall back to the defense here. Ukraine's pushing closer to Zaporizhia, and uh, the allegation is that Russia's going to uh, attempt a false flag operation to justify uh, some sort of nuclear accident there to blame on Ukraine, and Ukraine is uh, uh, demanding action from the international community. Uh, uh, Recep er Erdogan is concerned enough to have taken Ukraine's side on this, which is a little interesting uh, because he's been mm, sort of friendly to the Russians in this during this during this conflict. He's played both sides against the middle quite a bit, uh, but he's been sympathetic to Vladimir Putin over the last several years, and so this is actually a a fairly significant um, story coming out of Ukraine today. I have that in a post this morning. Uh, also, Washington Post columnist uh, offered up a very strange strategy for Joe Biden. This is the subject of my VIP column today, and I hope that you'll enjoy that. Uh, the uh, the idea is, is to offer, uh, or just to pardon Trump, to issue a pardon for Donald Trump uh, to uh, bolster Biden's own standing as a man who wants to see justice done, but uh, normal, normalcy restored. Uh, that's a very odd suggestion for uh, in regards to somebody who hasn't even been charged with a crime <laughs> and um, certainly would be coming a little late and very self-serving, even as uh, this column, this argument lays it out, it'd be very self-serving for Joe Biden to do this, but especially after all the political blowback of the raid on Mar-a-Lago. Uh, this is um, fanciful to say the least. Uh, it's a, it's not quite unprecedented. Nixon didn't ask for a pardon and he wasn't formally charged with a crime when he resigned from office. Ford claimed that he did this on his own. There was allegations that Nixon had arranged this with Ford if the uh, resignation had to take place. Everybody's always denied that. Everybody who is involved, who could possibly have been involved in that is dead by now. So, uh, you know, you can speculate all you want, but Ford had always said he did it for the good of the country and uh, didn't want to uh, take the country through a very divisive trial of a former president who'd already resigned and was no longer eligible for uh, the presidency in any case. Um, and that has stood for 50 years. So th there is a precedent for it, but this is not exactly the circumstance under which a pardon would, <laughs> would make a whole lot of sense especially since the Department of Justice can't still hasn't articulated a case against Donald Trump for anything. And the basis of their search was the Espionage Act, which they've promoted through leaks over the last several days. It's the same Espionage Act that they absolutely refused to enforce against Hillary Clinton in arguably worse circumstances. Yes, Donald Trump may have had uh, classified material at Mar-a-Lago, and if so, he shouldn't have had it. Um, he claims that he de declassified it in a sort of de facto manner, which is not really how that works. But Hillary Clinton didn't have the authority to de declassify the uh, classified information, including top secret and compartmented information that they found in her emails. And she wasn't just holding it at Chappaqua. She was actively transmitting this through an unsecured email server. And for four years, 
and the Department of Justice refused to take any action against her, it's going to be very difficult to explain why suddenly this is an issue uh, for a potential presidential candidate when it wasn't six years ago. Uh, so this sounds more like a cover your ass uh, move by Joe Biden. Anyway, I go into quite quite a bit of detail on that in my VIP column. Hope you get a chance to read that. Jazz Shaw is kicking in some extra stuff today because John Sexton's on vacation. We do let people out of the room every once in a while. John's on vacation. Have a great day off, John. Uh, uh, by the way, and uh, if you're if you watch this, I hope you did have a great day off. Um, so Jazz kicked in a couple of extras, and he's got some good columns up today. Uh, he wrote he wrote about um, the January six. Um, convictions, more people convicted of parading. Um, and he, like I, um, is skeptical about the about the way that this process is unfolding. And that brings me to today's guest on the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. It's uh, legendary, I think you can say, um, or at least veteran actor Nick Searcy, actor-director Nick Searcy, who uh, just finished a, uh, a documentary called Capital Punishment. That's capital with an O. Capital Punishment, it's a full-length documentary that is at his site, uh, and you can go to capitalpunishment.locals.com, again, using the O, not the A in capital, um, and uh, it will take you right to his site. You can also use the direct link, which is nicksearcy.locals.com, and you can either subscribe to his um, to his uh, newsletter, his, his website, or you can buy the documentary for a one-time fee of $9.99. Anyway, Nick and I talk for about 30 minutes. He's a great guy. We've talked before, and uh, we have a lot of fun. We joke around with each other quite a bit, but there's uh, and there's some humor in Capital Punishment too, mostly focusing on Nick. We talk a little bit about that as well. But there are some very there are some very concerning issues that this documentary raises. Even if you think that the people who went into the Capitol um, were you know were wrong, uh, broke the law should be investigated the way that this is unfolding and the the disconnect between that insurrection which i think is a you you can make a legitimate argument for it being an insurrection in in theory and the way that the department of justice has completely ignored actual outright armed insurrections in american cities in 2020 including my former home of uh, the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul, in the George Floyd Square, which was um, an armed um, a, an armed autonomous zone, Seattle's CHAZ. There was one in Washington, D.C. There was one briefly in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, all of these were seized by people uh, who claimed that the United States writ no longer ran in their autonomous zones, and certainly not the state and local authorities either. And those are insurrections. That is an insurrection. So why aren't we pursuing that those insurrections while we're pursuing the other ones? It's something that Nick's um, uh, Nick's documentary raises. It's a good question. Uh, you get a chance to meet some of the people whose lives have been destroyed um, on the basis of them being there. And again, you can agree or not disagree. You can agree or disagree with with the pursuit of those people. But there is a sense that there is a very political. Um, uh, mode of driving a lot of this. And whether or not you agree with Nick, I think the biggest issue here is that somehow we are being told that we shouldn't even discuss these issues, right? Merrick Garland and Christopher Ray said, well, all this criticism of the FBI is generating threats against us. People need to stop criticizing us so much because uh, it's, it's creating threats. Th that's nonsense. These are law enforcement uh, organizations that are answerable to the American people, and we have a right to demand answers about how they're doing their jobs. And it doesn't matter whether you've got a few nutcases and idiots uh, threatening attacks, and you got one idiot in Cincinnati who actually outright attacked an FBI office for who knows what reason. I mean, it was insane, and ended up dying because of it, because he wouldn't surrender. Um, that doesn't limit my uh, ability to question what the FBI and the Department of Justice is doing, and it shouldn't, and it shouldn't uh, limit the way that we discuss this and demand answers. And that's, I think, the real value of Nick Searcy's documentary, Capital Punishment. Also, he's doing something over at The Daily Wire. He's got a new uh, film out called Terror on the Prairie. We talk about that too. He's also uh, co-starring in a film about Ronald Reagan that's going to st uh, star Dennis Quaid. Talk a little bit about that. And uh, and we'll also talk about 
Gosnell, he, he directed Gosnell, he co-starred in Gosnell, talk a little bit about the the impact, the fallout uh, from that, and I think you'd be surprised by the answer on that, by the way. Um, I was a little surprised by it. not terribly surprised, because I kind of heard some of this before, but I think you'd be a little surprised about, you know, the form that that might have taken, and, uh, and Nick's a pretty... Uh, Nick's a pretty funny guy. I think you'll just enjoy the conversation. But if you if you enjoyed Jazz's post on the um, on the parading uh, prosecutions, then I think you'll also enjoy this with Nick Searcy. NickSearcy.locals.com is his is his website. Capital Punishment is his documentary. And uh, maybe we should just keep having discussions like this. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned afterwards. By the way, if assuming that. We don't get kicked off of uh, social media for even discussing these issues. Stay tuned afterwards about how you can subscribe, not just to my podcast, but also at uh, at the Town Hall Hot Air VIP program, which allows us to keep from being silenced on these issues. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. I am honored today to introduce Nick Searcy, who is just a... a uh, uh, a legendary Hollywood actor, also director. He directed the uh, Gosnell movie a few years back. I think, Nick, that was maybe the last time you and I actually talked live. Um, I think that's true, yeah. I mean, I think the last time that we... It wasn't the last time we interacted. I'm, I'm joking. I got to tell you, my favorite Nick Searcy story. <laughs> my favorite Nick Searcy story. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got one, right, Nick? Right. My favorite Nick Searcy story was when I... after, And I was telling it today on the live chat, right? Um, is after I wrote the review of The Shape of Water, which you were great in, and that was that was it. I, and, you know, clearly I hated this, and I was making all sorts of, I was all over Twitter on this thing, just, just venting my spleen, and I'd written this review. And you tweeted back at me and said, you left out the, the, the real reason why people should go see this movie. I'm in it. <laughs> right. And I laughed. That's right. I laughed so hard. You're, this is the only time I've ever amended i was not really amended but it's the only time i've ever amended a review i put that in there and i said well there you go this is the reason why you got to go see the shape of water that's right it's terrible but i'm in it so you have to go so. <laughs> exactly exactly go see the shape of water just don't pay for yeah. it but go see the shape of water Nick, but you know it's, it's funny i i know people that really love that movie you know it's, and Absolutely. it's sort of you know it's, and i kind of liked it too just because to me it was like a throwback to the creature of the black lagoon or something like that it just sort of it got a little more sexy than the creature of the black lagoon. <laughs> yeah. well, the sexy part I actually didn't have much of a problem with Nick. That wasn't really the issue. But you know, uh, right. <laughs> I, you know, it, it, you know, I I don't want to get too much into that movie because it is what no. it is. It's it's been and gone. I want to talk about the two movies that you're working that you are in right now. One of which right. you produced. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a documentary, Capital Punishment, capital with the O. Uh, talking about the events of January 6th and giving us a much different look at this than the mainstream media wants us to look at, that the FBI wants to talk about. And, you know, I think that this is actually the moment, right, for yeah. for this documentary because of what happened at Mar-a-Lago, what's been going on with politicization at the FBI. And, right. and I think people are ready to say, I don't really care if people are saying we shouldn't talk about this. We actually need to talk about this. Even if you don't necessarily agree with everything that's in this film, these are things, that, you know, people are telling their personal stories or personal, their personal experiences with this. And I think it's important that this gets talked about openly because this is what we're supposed to be doing in America. Mm -hmm. Well, people, the people that went to Washington on January 6th, like I did, have been so, uh, so demonized and so uh, lied about in so many ways by the media that, you know, everybody thinks it was only a few hundred people when it was probably two million. Everybody thinks that everybody that went there did all this stuff in the Capitol when it was only a few hundred. Right. And, you know, they, they don't even now it's just beginning to come out. How many of the people there were actually fake MAGA supporters that did a lot of the breaking and the vandalism? Yep. And some of them were even FBI operatives, as we're seeing in the uh, Whitmer case. You know, in the in the the fake kidnapping of Governor Whitmer case. The the twelve the the, the twelve uh, defendants with the ten um, the the ten uh, <laughs> FBI uh, operatives, right. or is it the other way around? The ten defendants <laughs> right. with the twelve FBI operatives. Yeah, I've seen. Uh, you know, our, our our sister side of Twitchy is covering some of those developments on the yeah. on the Whitmer case. It's, I mean, it's it's very very concerning. 
Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's one of those things. It's like when you've got more FBI agents than you have actual <laughs> people who want to do something, and they were the instigate. But anyway, that's the thing that starts to if you follow that story, then it becomes less and less difficult to believe that the FBI also was doing something nefarious on January 6th. And the thing that happened at Mar-a-Lago, I, I don't, I'm not glad that it happened, but the fact of the matter is, as you see in my movie, normal decent Americans have been being treated like Trump was treated for over a year and a half now. And it's about time that people start waking up to how the FBI is operating, not only with President Trump, but with hundreds and hundreds of decent, normal Americans who did nothing except go to Washington on January 6th and sing some hymns and pray because they thought that the election was stolen. Right. And, and I, I mean, you, your, your, your camera work or, you know, the film, the film that you include in this really captures the size of the crowd. And it really does emphasize the very small percentage of people who actually went into the Capitol. Most of the people were there for the rally. Right. Right. And most of the people there were, you know, uh, the joke I always make is that they were my age or older. What were we going to do? Uh, <laughs> you, you know, what were we armed with except for our blood pressure medicine? You know, so it, it's it's kind of difficult to to swallow all the characterizations by the media of, uh, you know, that was an insurrection or it, it wasn't. Insurrections usually involve weapons. Well, and you mentioned this, and this is actually one of the best points I think you make in the film, because I've been making this point several times over the last years. You know, I, I just moved to Texas about a year ago, Nick, and I was in the Twin Cities for 23 years. Right. And so I was there very close to Ground Zero. I had family members who were actually really close to Ground Zero uh, for the uh, George Floyd riots, right? And the, you know, the autonomous zone that was erected it was there for months. It might even still be there. Uh, which right. were patrolled by armed gangs. The, the, the Seattle Chaz, it was ground seized by armed gangs that was declared not part of the United States anymore, but um, under the, under the uh, I don't know what you call the, the uh, sovereignty of these mm -hmm. armed gangs who were liberating them in the name of the people. Now, those are insurrections. Now, I, yeah. I can understand. I think it's arguable. You can, you can say what happened at the Capitol was an insurrection, although it wasn't armed. Those are armed insurrections that took place in Seattle, took place in Minneapolis, took place in Washington, D.C., took place in Portland, Oregon, where they'd spent weeks attacking federal buildings there. And yet the yeah. media never covers that as insurrections. Those are literally insurrections. And your point, your movie makes that point. And I, I, I got to say, Nick, I, I'm watching this. I'm going, yes, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Well, it and it's uh, the double standards is infuriating. Yep. And and if this was happening, let's say if Trump had won and it was Biden supporters that the FBI were knocking down their doors and, and coming in without a warrant and, and uh, you know, basically ruining their lives, tying them up in legal battles, which really we should make a sequel to, to go into how the people are being mistreated by the legal well, system. I think you're going to have terrible. plenty of, you're going to have plenty of material to do that over the next year or so, apparently. Yeah. 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 But a lot of these people, you know, you, it's a funny thing about these charges. If you're charged in the District of Columbia, you have to hire a lawyer that is licensed to practice in the District right. of Columbia. You can't bring your hometown lawyer with you who happens to be a genius. you got to find somebody in Washington. And the lawyers in Washington, it's a 95% Democrat town. Yep. So most of the lawyers there really despise their clients. <laughs> in, in this, in, you know, they want them to go to jail, you know. So well, it, I got to tell you, Nick, difficult I, situation. knowing who works in Washington, D.C., I can kind of understand that attitude just a little bit, at least. Now, I'm, you know, of course, yeah. I'm obviously yeah. joking around. But yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, that is actually one of the more arcane uh, issues that have come up. I mean, you, you cover some of the other issues, you get actual footage of some of the um, of some of the raids on people's residences, people who yeah. didn't pose any threats at all, but were treated as though uh, you needed a SWAT team to go in and arrest them. And you talked to some of those families. A couple of them are now homeless. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even if you think that these people broke the law, there's there's supposed to be uh, rights yeah. involved here. You know, being able to call an attorney, making sure that you that people know that you're under arrest. You know, yeah. being able to see a judge right away to uh, to arrange for bail if bail can be arranged. I mean, those are some of the things that we take for granted 
And as you document in this, according to the people who've gone through this process, those rights were, were not respected in this process. No, not at all. And, and most of the people in my movie did not go inside the building. Right. I think the only people that we interviewed that actually went inside the building were the two 74-year-old twin grandmas who... Uh, oh, that's right. Yes. You know, they, they went in and they asked the police if it was okay. And the police said yes. And they took a few pictures and they went home and the FBI showed up three weeks later because like their neighbors turned them in or something. And that's another thing that's in the movie about how they've turned American citizens against each other. You know, you have people informing on these people as if we're in Soviet Russia. You know, you're, you're turning in your neighbors to the yep. Gestapo. It's, it's terrible. But Well, uh, you know, it reminded me of something that I found that uh, I, I, I'm sure you were able to call this, but after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, the Stasi was disbanded right. in, in East Germany and uh, West Germany or, you know, the, the United um, German government that emerged after that published the, a lot of the information that was in, in the, the stuff that they could publish because some of it was very personal. And they didn't want to embarrass people. But right. what it turned out was is that the Stasi wasn't actually that large. <laughs> it's just that everybody was informing on each other, trying to right. curry favor with uh, trying to curry favor with individual Stasi officers. And yeah. it doesn't take much to set that kind of thing up. You see this, you know, it, it, I, I got to tell you, one of the things that came up and it just came up today, right, or, or last night, yeah. was the fact that they're, they kicked the libs of TikTok off of Facebook. And they, they've reinstated her since, but um, but it was supposed to be permanent because supposedly she was spreading misinformation about Boston Children's Hospital. Right. Now, social media i think has become sort of a snitch society and they've set these they've set these social media platforms up to be a snitch society and mm -hmm. i've i've been talking about this for years and i'm sure that somebody's going to snitch on on me for on youtube for talking to you which is fine because if i get kicked off of youtube it's less work for me so i'm actually okay <laughs> with this nick <laughs> that's right i mean anybody i talk to gets kicked off of youtube that's, that's usually what happens but i mean but but it, it gets to that to that um that sort of uh, a cultural sense that we've really lost the thread of what it means to actually have open debate, what it means to actually hold government accountable. One of the things that I think comes through wow. in your in uh, capital punishment, and again, I because I need to make sure I'm good about this, capital punishment with an O, and you can go to nicksearcy.locals.com, right. nicksearcy.locals.com, and you can either subscribe to Nick Searcy's page or you can just buy the movie on its own for... Um, yeah. For a for a low low a low low price of uh, nine ninety nine. So, um, right. um, but one of the things that comes through in this is the idea that not only are we not supposed to question authority, we're not even supposed to talk about it. We we've seen this this week, where you have um, Chris Ray, Christopher Ray, FBI director, Merrick Garland, the uh, Department of Justice, you know, Attorney General who are getting up and saying, all of you people who are criticizing the FBI and, and demanding investigations, you're creating uh, threats against, you're, you're creating an environment for threats against the FBI. You guys have to really shut up now. And yeah. I mean, it's remarkable how many people don't <laughs> question that. You've got media outlets that are saying, well, you know, they've, they've, threats have increased threefold against the FBI. Well, nobody thinks it's smart to threaten the FBI. I think it's stupid to threaten the FBI. You shouldn't yeah. do that. But that doesn't mean that we should shut up about abuses of authority and abuses of power by the FBI. There's a long and glorious history of abuses of power by the FBI, and it doesn't appear that things have cleaned up as much as people thought it did. No, and saying something like, I don't trust the FBI because of the way they've been behaving, that's not a threat. That's no. just a fact. And, you know, if they you know, they, they are actually, in the, in the other uh, direction, they're actually causing threats to people in America who went to Washington on January 6th, constantly calling them Nazis, constantly calling them racist, white supremacists, insurrectionists, violent extremists, all this stuff. They're the ones whipping up hate, not us. Right. Yes. And uh, as you well document in Capital Punishment, again, you can get it at nickseercy.locals.com. I, I, yeah. I got to remember yeah. to promote these things, Nick. So, you know, <laughs> there's there's a method to this. I need to stretch yeah. it out a little bit further. But but and I mean, you can see me wear this hat. I love film. that hat. Well, Make America yeah. talented again. And by the way, in case you're wondering whether or not this is all grim, and some of it is. I mean, I, I thought that the um, interview with... Um, uh, the, the family that had been uh, booted out of their home 
over this was yeah. grim. There's some humor in this. I mean, there's some there's some there's some laugh lines in this. They they mostly yeah. belong to Nick, of course, because it's his yeah. film. But I mean, I mean, it's it's actually pretty it's actually a pretty entertaining approach to this as well, which I think it requires it. And um, you know, you you kind of bookend this by uh, portraying a mock congressional hearing in which you're all the characters. Right. <laughs> right. I was very amused by that. It's, it's actually a good way to set that up. Yeah. Well, we when I made the movie, I, I really can't make a movie without making a few stupid jokes. But it it if we hadn't had the humor in it, it would have been hard to watch. Yes. I mean, it, it's really uh, it would have been like a plane crash. You know, it's just just yeah. downer all the way. So I think the humor is necessary. It gives you a little chance to sort of shake it off before you move on to the next horrible thing. Yeah. It does. It does. Um, and and I thought that uh, the I think it was towards the end, or maybe even the last. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it because I don't yeah. want to. I don't want to. I don't want to give away a spoiler. <laughs> but but the end of it, Nick is actually very amusing at the very mm -hmm. end. So I'll, I'll just say that I, I don't want right. to give away a spoiler. Um, I, and, and by the way, thank you for interviewing my friend Evan Sayet, who I hadn't heard from for a while, and now I know why. <laughs> yeah, no, Evan is a, a tremendous part of the film. I mean, he, he, he brings a lot of wisdom that the book that he wrote, uh, wrote the uh, woke supremacy. Yes, is really valuable. And that's a very, very wise uh, book. And a lot of that uh, information is in capital punishment. You know, and I mean, we can expand beyond this, too, because I mean, part of this whole silencing thing, and I, I, I don't want to hit this for too much longer. I think we're We've yeah. sold the movie here. I want to move on to the next movie that we want to sell, right. Terror on the Prairie. <laughs> right. But I mean, you know, you see this, uh, you see this same process in place in, in terms of uh, transgender ideology, where it, even questioning it is, yeah. is, is a cancellation move, uh, is it will get you kicked off of social media. You can't even question that. You can't question right. the FBI. You can't question transgender ideology. And I think Evan actually does a really good job of connecting the dots as to why uh, yeah. that that uh, comes through. So, you know, capital punishment. I think if you read, if you watch Capital Punishment, yes, it's about January sixth, but it's actually a lot about a lot more. And there's a, there's more at stake here uh, than just what happened on January sixth. And right. and I and I really think that even if you don't necessarily agree with Nick on everything, you you really need to to be thinking about these things because we're well, we're marching into we're marching into a completely different paradigm and i don't know that people are even aware of it that's right and ed people really need to agree with everything nick says well, course, that's just yeah. a fact well that just goes oh. without saying <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. nick we got to talk about your your other film here too which is terror on the prairie and i mean this is something that's coming out from the daily wire ben shapiro brilliant guy um who is who's moved into filmmaking? He got Gina Carano after she got canceled for I don't even remember what it was that she got canceled over. It was some silly thing. It and, was making fun of the uh, pronouns, right? She, yeah, she 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 said her pronouns were beep bop boop or something like that. And that's people, it. And people just lost their minds over this. Right. I, you know, I, right. I, I I I'm also kind of an English language pedant, so I really hate the pronoun thing. <laughs> To me, yeah. nobody has their own pronouns. You can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself, and I won't disrespect that. But I'm using the English language pronouns because yeah. that's what they are. It's how we communicate right. with each other. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm already sort of... Anyway, Terror on the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> that's it they just canceled us right in the middle of the interview oh my gosh yes um so if you haven't if you've made it this far you know youtube's asleep at the switch all right terror on the prairie uh western western movie made under a uh, a fairly new i think this is this ben shapiro's first feature film uh that, you know under daily wire or is this this might be his second i'm trying to remember this is the second one that they've made but it's the fourth one they've released there are two feature films that were already made that they bought and released got it but this is the second one that was actually produced by the daily wire well you're a filmmaker i mean uh, from what i've seen of these films that uh, that they're working on they're doing a a really creditable job of, yeah. of doing this and this is not an easy business i mean you can't just buy a couple of cameras and <laughs> I mean, no. as much as you think you might be able to get a couple of iPhones and some editing software and, and golly, you're a filmmaker that doesn't work that way. 
No, I mean, they, they hired Dallas Sonier to, to produce the film and Michael Polish directed it. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is a major studio release. It's equivalent to anything coming out of Hollywood. Sure. I think that the, uh, the, the difference is that this movie is not in, it's not necessarily a political movie by any means. It's just an old fashioned bloody Western, but it's, uh, it's not burdened by any woke ideology being forced upon it. You know, it's there's, right. There's no, there's no leftist moral to the story, which is what is the problem with so many Hollywood films these days. You can just see the politics coming a mile away and it's boring. It's political. It, it is not a political didactic, in other words, which has got to be a, a, a breath of fresh air after working in Hollywood for as long as you have, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. And it's, it's nice to be working with people that, uh, that don't hate my guts just because I'm openly not a Democrat. Right. Know? Yes. Well, that, that helps too. Yes. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure it's a more pleasant experience on the set. So, you know, I think you're originally from Texas, right? And you're, I mean, that's, uh, that's North a, Carolina. No, oh, you're North originally Carolina. North Carolina. That's right. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I apologize. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I, I moved to Texas and now I think everybody's from Texas. So yeah. there you go. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't think this is the first Western you've ever made. Um, it's the second. Is it really? The, is it only the yeah. second Western you've ever made? Okay. Well, I was in, I had a part in Return to Lonesome Dove, but I was really a farmer. I wasn't a cowboy. Uh, uh, so it didn't count as a Western, <laughs> but um, to me, but uh, I did a Western that's coming out later this year with Nicolas Cage called The Old Way. Oh, wow. So, okay. That sounds interesting. So, so that'll be coming out later, but that, that was the first Western I did. And then Terror on the Prairie, they called about a month after I got back from uh, doing the old way. And I went straight back to the same town in Montana that, and did terror on the prairie. It was the same. We shot both movies in the same town. It was crazy. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. So tell us, so give us a, give us the layout of terror on the prairie. Uh, Gina Carano, obviously one of the stars in there. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about the plot and tell us a little bit about your character, the captain. Well, I'm the terror. I'm the title role. I, I assumed. The... I assumed. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, basically, it it's a classic sort of revenge story. My character is hunting down people that I have a grudge against, which I won't tell the specifics right. of right because that's part of the fun of the movie. But you know, I'm I'm tracking down these people that have done me wrong. And so one of the it's very violent and it's very bloody. There's scalping and there's gouging and there's throat cutting and shooting right. and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and and basically Gina plays a, a a lady that lives on the prairie with her husband and her her children. And her husband happens to be away when the terror comes calling. So she has to kind of hold her own against us until he can get back. And and he's actually the one I'm looking for anyway. So. It's a, it's a lot of action and a, some great acting from uh, from Gina and from uh, from me and my gang. It's it's really a well acted uh, movie. I understand that Daniel Day Lewis's son is one of the is one of the actors that's in this film. Right, it's his first film. He did a great job. He was really really good. Um, and a lot of interesting people in it. Uh, Tyler Fisher, the comedian, he plays one of my gang members and. Uh, and a man named Heath Freeman, who actually, uh, he died about a week after we finished shooting. Oh, which that's a terrible, that's... terrible shock to all of us, but wonderful performance by him. Um, it's, it's, a really, it's a really great film. I do wish that more people could see it. The only way you can see it is to be a subscriber at the Daily Wire, but uh, they didn't ask me what I thought about that. Well, of course not. No, 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 no. And, you know, it's, it's, you know look, I mean, Salem's doing something similar. They're, 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 they're working on documentaries and i i think they did one at least one scripted film final frequency i think is what it was called right and that's behind the paywall at salem too so you know you, you have to subscribe yeah. to salem now in order to get access to that but um uh, you know it's that but this is how the this is how the entertainment industry is evolving right i mean it's it's yeah. it's, it's it's getting to this point where people have to go out and they have to be wise consumers right they have to go out and look for um, the the services that will speak to them and that won't maybe won't lecture them and right. I think Ben Shapiro Jeremy, Jeremy Boring I mean they're not just doing films they got that razor thing going on over at Daily Wire too right. which cracks me up but apparently yeah. it's hugely successful for them yeah no it's doing well and the the documentary that they released right before Terror on the Prairie What Is a Woman 
Oh so, yeah, massive. Boss did that. That that did really well for them. So they're they're making some really high quality products over there, and uh, I hope they continue to do it. I just think that the next time they make a feature feature film, especially one like Hair on the Prairie, which is so visual and so just beautiful to look at, um, I hope they come up with a way to maybe have a theatrical run with it for a little while first, and then put it behind the paywall. Because I think in really in order to compete with Hollywood movies you you kind of have to compete on their battleground as well well you i think that's yeah get in the fray you know that makes like sense gosnell like when we made gosnell we released it in the theaters for a while and it uh, did pretty well you know i should ask you what was did you get blowback from um direct you, you were both directing and acting in gosnell which is a great film by the way and well, you know you. uh um uh, i know phelan and Anne pretty well and yeah. um and I was really happy with um, how well it worked out for everybody. What was the what was the repercussions for you um, coming out of Gosnell? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing about Hollywood. It's like they don't call you up and say, boy, we hate you now. You know, <laughs> they just stop calling. They just don't call as much. And, you know, that that might have happened. I mean, I, I did quite a few things after Gosnell. I mean, I, I certainly have continued to work and. You know, but I, I think it's it may have uh, trimmed the pool of people that are willing to work with me, or you know, thinned the herd a little bit. But you know, that's that's fine. I, I I'm I'm fortunate enough to have gotten to the point in my life where it means more to me to to do things that I care about, that I that I'm uh, personally invested in, rather than just you know looking for an acting job. My my kids are grown; they're doing fine. You know, I'm rich whatever <laughs> you know well, that's the best just, revenge right? <laughs> right i'm just I'd, and and like i said before i mean i wind up working a lot more with people who who like me who who maybe choose me because of my my uh, outspokenness so that that works a lot, out a little better for me all right well one last topic i just gotta squeeze this in because you know i i i I do what I usually do with IMDb. I obsess over it constantly during the day. I, I just love IMDb. Yeah. And yeah. I see that you've got another uh, film that's going to be coming out, um, probably after The Old Way, uh, where you play James Baker in a movie called Reagan. Can you tell that's us a little right. bit about that? I think it's going to come out early 23. Okay. Um, it's uh, Dennis Quaid plays Reagan. And it's a really big, big independent film. It's probably a $20 million feature. Wow, and it and it, it takes uh, it takes Reagan uh, from the time he was governor all the way through his presidency, and it's it's really a, a kind of a sweeping film, a uh, real biopic, and uh, it was great fun. I mean, I had a great time. Dennis Quaid's a great guy, and playing James Baker was fun. You know, I uh, I jokingly, <laughs> I, you know, I probably shouldn't say this joke, but it's like I played swamp creatures before. You know, so. <laughs> Well, there you go. That's I, I like that joke. That's a good joke. All right. Well, I don't think James would like that joke very much. Probably the, I have, not. Have a lot of I'll have a lot of respect for, for Mr. Baker, and it was an honor to play him. Well, he might actually he might have actually laughed at that joke. Actually, I right. mean, I mean, he's he was he was around long enough to know to know the score, right? And so, and I've played a you know I've played a lot of racists and wife beaters, and I mean I've played a lot of Democrats in the past. You know, so. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, I'm pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure the uh, the fried green tomatoes character was probably a Democrat, right? Oh, like, definitely. He was yeah. in the Klan. There yeah, you go. You bet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I made my. Uh, that was my big break playing a Democrat. Yeah. There, there you go. There you go. All right, Nick. You know, um, let's go ahead and wrap up here. But why don't you tell people where people can where, where they can find you? Uh, talk. Yeah. Uh, promote one last time. Capital punishment at, at your yeah. at your website and how people can uh, uh, dig into that. Yeah, the best place to go is capitalpunishment.locals.com. That will feed you right to nicksearcy.locals.com. And you can either become a uh, an annual subscriber and get the movie as part of that package, or you can just buy the movie on its own if you don't want to see all the wonderful other stuff that I do. But um, that's that's the best place to get that. And uh, Terror on the Prairie, you can go to the dailywire.com and sign up. It's worth it. Uh, even if you just sign up for a month and just watch, just watch Terror on the Prairie and then turn it off. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really good movie. And, uh, and you can find me almost every day on Twitter at yes, Nick Cersei until I get kicked off of there too. 
So. Well, I, I think you and I have worked pretty good to try to get us both kicked off to, you know, after, after this thing goes live, right? I don't know why they haven't kicked me off. I've been trying really hard. It's like, what have I got to do? <laughs> well, I am sure you're going to succeed at some point, not because of anything that you do, but just because of the, of the, um, the, the humorless prigs that run these social media. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, platforms. They'll so get around to me sooner or later. Eventually they're going to get around to all of us, my friend, all of us. Nick Searcy, thank you so much for doing this today. Great talking to you again. You too, Ed. Thanks for having me. All right. Stay tuned for a little bit more from the Ed Morrissey Show coming up right, right next. If, if, you're, if this is still playing at the end of this. Thank you for watching and listening to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Be sure to subscribe at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube to get alerted as soon as new episodes get published. You can support The Ed Morrissey Show and Hot Air's VIP reporting by becoming a VIP member, too. Visit hotairvip.com and use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, all one word, for 40% off your membership. Choose VIP Gold and gain membership to access to all of the town hall sites. Thanks again for watching and listening.